Nisi. Um, Nisi. So Jamie's checking Nisi Kaya. Okay. So we chat to everyone and that gives us the best chance of finding animals. We can spread out through the reserve and check different areas. So while, there we go, there's Dave's cloth coming, flying into shot. Well, while we check the north and the east, uh, let's go see how Jamie's endeavors around the hyena dens are going. Good morning and welcome on our sunrise safari. It's wonderful to have you all on board once again. My name is Jamie and this morning I have Kat on camera with me, the guy that you all know as Carrot, but his name is actually Kat. But we are on our way to check the hyena den as Brent explained. Now unfortunately we had a little bit of a minor attack of the gremlins so we haven't quite got there just yet. But we are on our way. We'll check the Gallagher shortcut and the Mvuba Road hyena den. So thank you to Chris Rogue for that update. That it seems as though, whilst most of our hyenas have moved off the property to Manuleti for now, it seems as though Gwen has been keeping true to her secretive self and been dodging us. She's obviously been somewhere between Gallagher shortcut and Mvuba Road, and all the times I've checked, she's just not been home. I have got very fresh tracks wandering south along Gallagher shortcut. I'm going to double check the hyena den there. And the unfortunate thing is those cubs are so young and because they are separate from the rest of the group, unless mom is home, the cubs won't come out to investigate us. And they've also, because we haven't been able to find them, they haven't quite got used to vehicles in the same, to the same extent that the rest of our hyena clan cubs have. But there's definitely fresh tracks here. It might, unfortunately, they're going in the wrong direction. It might be Gwen going out to look for food. Right, now, of course, you are all as devastated as I am that I'm not wearing my magnificent pom-pom beanie. That's because I can't find it, which means I've got this particular beanie that needs constant readjustment. Otherwise, it looks ridiculous. <laughs> but do ever fear, I'm sure the pom-pom beanie is somewhere really simple i just am not entirely sure where it may be i i have a suspicion i might have accidentally left it in brent's vehicle although we couldn't find it there this morning so we'll never know we'll figure it out but please don't mourn the loss of the beanie it's not gone forever i know you were all very attached to it as was i i'm sure it is here somewhere all righty here we go entrance to the galago shortcut oh creaking rusty Gallego shortcut den. Let's check here first. Make sure we do a thorough inspection. Somebody was calling just before we went out on the sunrise safari. I mean, some hyena was calling as we went out on the sunrise safari. The only thing is, I can't understand why she took them all the way down to the Buetelapan. So I'm not 100% convinced we're going to find anything here, but it's worth checking nonetheless. Big herd of buffaloes walk through. There's dung everywhere. There's also elephant tracks everywhere. No, all is quiet here. That is sort of what I was expecting. Let's just double check this side. It means ducking under some rather low hanging branches. So everybody watch heads there. Hyenas, are you here? Are you home? No, definitely not. All is quiet at the Gallego shortcut den, which was sort of to be expected. Just listening for a second. Nope, nobody home. Just the silence of a winter's morning. Next, Vuvuro Den. I'm still trying to work out why she, Chris Rogue said she went east in that drainage system. I don't know of any hyena dens further east, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. It just means we haven't found it yet. So while we do some reversing underneath the low hanging branches, let's go back to Brent for an update.
So I've got some lioness tracks. I'm just trying to figure out how fresh they are. There's been quite a lot of elephant around here. Um, and this is one of the main access roads in and out. So they are looking quite fresh. I'm trying to see where they go off the road. Well, they are on some quite hard stuff here. So if I do see a nice clear track, I will show you. And at the moment, it's going to be very difficult in this low light. I'm still heading straight down the center of the road. Oh, come on, where are you guys going? Oh, still there, still there. Well, oh no, that's a good place to change direction. Um, okay, there's last tracks now, still coming. Oh, I'm going to have to turn around before I get a crink in my neck. Now, we've got a, a couple of crinks. One's that one, one's this one. That one's not a normal one for us, so I'll try and minimize our neck crinks. Okay, let's have a look. Hopefully they don't go to the north. Okay. Still got tracks going down. Where have you gone, lion? It only looks like a single lioness. Okay. Amazing how tracks seem to disappear. Ah, uh, no, there she went, down in Vubu, so I'm just going to call Jamie. Jamie, Jamie. Tracks of a single line is um, coming down in Vubu, so just have a look on your side there. Okay, yeah, the tracks, there we are, and a bit of softer sand, so we might be able to show you. Let me just get us in a good spot. How's that, Dave? There we go. Here yeah, those line tracks we're following. Just a single lioness. Now, could this be the one from the Buffles Hook Den? Or could this be the other female with the other cubs? And we're going to keep following. I guess she's going to go down that elephant path there. So we're going to loop around. And see if her tracks come out on the other side. She could have, of course, stayed on the road, but I don't know she didn't. But she might just take the shortcut across the corner. Oh. Oh, very upset Franklin, right where those tracks were going. So maybe she's around. I'm just going to check a little bit further along here. Uh, if not, I'm going to go take a little quick walk down onto these paths here to see if her tracks continue on there. And just make sure she doesn't come back out into the road. And she doesn't. So while I just go check some of these elephant paths here quickly, uh, let's go see how Jamie's endeavors are faring. Already the morning off to an exciting start. Since I'm in the vicinity, I'm going to be giving Brent a hand whilst checking the hyena dens at the same time. But I wonder, I mean, it's, it's just a thought, it's a passing thought. I wonder whether that lioness hasn't been keeping her cubs somewhere in that region. And that in turn might have encouraged our hyena mother 
to move her little brood away from the area. It's just a thought. It's a passing thought. I don't know where she would have moved them to. Trying to work that one out is a little bit tricky. But we're going to try. We'll check in Vubu Road. I've checked the Philemon's cut line den. There's nothing there. There's no tracks going in or out. But the only other place that I know to check is Aubrey's Road. But that's in completely the opposite direction of where Chris Rogue saw them heading. But we're just going to speed up ever so slightly because now I'm doing circles upon myself. I did hear the Franklin alarm calling that Brent had. But we're not far from him either. Let's just duck through this drainage. Oh, it's cold in the dips. Brr. This is definitely, I, I don't know, it's, it's pretty much close to my favorite time of year to be out in the bush, particularly at this time of morning. I believe we have a suggestion as to where my pom-pom hat might be. I think that came through from Morning Glory, who suggested that the gremlins have stolen it in order to snuggle up in on this cold winter's morning. I feel as though that's an entirely plausible suggestion because I'm relatively certain I left my hat in the car. I'm, always, I'm, I'm convinced. Oh, uh, no, I didn't because I wasn't driving this vehicle when I was wearing my beanie. Oh, it must be under Brent's stuff. Must be there somewhere. Okay. We'll take a quick trip past Gallagher Pan and see whether or not there's any sign of A, the lioness, B, the hyena, or see anything else coming across to drink. One of the few remaining water sources in this area. we go we've got even more of a clue as to what's happening here first thing in the morning from Chris Rogue whoopsie hey everybody look at the Sun <laughs> we're gonna keep looking that way let's see if we can't spot a leopard or a lion or a hyena got to make sure you check everything on your right hand side Right, Chris Rogue has said that this morning she heard soft contact calls on the dam camera from a lioness. So perhaps our lioness moving her cubs, and of course we've got the prospect of at, at least two, probably three in Kahuma lionesses, definitely three lionesses with cubs. So we didn't know, we knew where one was hidden in that drainage line around Buffelzug Dam, but perhaps... There might be others around. Hmm. All very mysterious. I'm just checking this area very carefully for tracks. In case she is. So the Nkuhuma, there's a whole, this is why the hyenas like this area. It's why Karula used to like this area before the hyenas and the lions moved in. There's a whole river system that runs throughout this particular area. It's a sort of series of interleading what we call drainage lines. Our drainage lines are basically places where the water has cut away at the earth and left deep, steep areas where there's plenty of cover, plenty of vegetation cover, plenty of rocks and crevices, and it makes for a really lovely spot for the animals of Juma to hide their little ones. Our brain's just trying to get hold of me. I think he wants me to help him check. Standing by. Whoopsie. Uh, Brent, I'll probably go south from there. I'm just checking Galago Pan now. I've done a loop, but I'm heading on to Mbubu now. <laughs> Copy. Um, apparently, there were contact calls heard on the damn camera early this morning, uh, around four-ish. Copy that. 
I'm going to quote Brent here. He says, tracks of that lioness go into the drainage line around or just opposite Mvubu Road and that he has decided that perhaps discretion is the better part of valour first thing in the morning. What that means, and that is 100% understandable, is we have yet to... We don't know what the Nkuhuma lionesses are like with their cubs. Some lionesses in areas actually are absolutely fine. If you stumble upon them, they give you a gentle growl and that's the end of the story. You back up and that's, that's the end. But um, he, I think he feels if he goes wandering in there now, there's a chance that she's going to come barreling out of the bushes at what will feel like 100 kilometers an hour. It won't be, but it'll be pretty close. 20 meters per second, 60 feet per second with a rumbling sound equivalent to a Harley Davidson starting up. And I promise you, we are wide awake enough in the morning as it is. We don't need that extra shot of adrenaline to kickstart our day. So we'll check carefully around here, but I think that Brent has decided a deep wandering into the impossible drainage line systems, and I know how thick it is there, perhaps is not the way he's going to go about his morning. But you don't have to take my word for it. You can hear it from the man himself. Over to Brent. Well, yes, no, um, I've tracked many lions into lion dens in my life, and uh, there's a very simple rule. You don't want to do it early in the morning, and you don't want to do it late in the evening. So if you are thinking that there might be a, watch, this is a pride, now there's one going the other way. Hmm, interesting. But as I was saying, you want to do it sort of at about the hottest time of the day when the lions are least active. Um, that is one way to sort of keep yourself intact in one piece. Okay, so I just need to have a quick look here. Okay, so out of these tracks, the freshest tracks actually look like they're heading back away. Well, let's keep on the ones that are staying on the road and out of drainage lines for now. Standing by. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here. There's tracks both directions. Almost trying to look down the road, see if there's a lion up ahead. And she's there walking on the left hand side of the road. There's just lion tracks everywhere at the moment. Now, these are from earlier last night. I can tell that because of the darkness around them, sort of condensation overnight. Now, where's the... Oh, no, she's left the road, the other one. But we have a look there. You can see early last night, before the morning dew, This is going the other way. The f more fresh tracks look like they've ducked off to the east here somewhere. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out which one's more fresh. The one going that way. I'm just trying to find one track on top of another. Yes, no. These definitely seem more fresh, the ones heading to the east. Now apparently there were contact calls heard around the Juma cam last night. So Jamie's going to check in that area while we continue to head east. I'm 
we've still got one female heading back towards Bufflesock waterhole. Maybe it's the mom. Went out for a forage, had some food and went back to the little cubs. top of the elephant track, so that's a good sign. Ooh, down in these dips is very chilly. Drops a degree or two as we go down into these little river systems. So I know Jamie's been in search of an active hyena den. Let's see how that search is going. I'm afraid to say that the search is not going all that well. Very sadly and sort of predictably, the Mvubu Road hyena den is quiet apart from several contact calling Franklins. Anybody home? Nope. No fresh tracks coming in here either. Where, oh where, is the lovely Gwen hiding herself? I'm running out of ideas. She might just not be home. She might have moved them to the Gallego shortcut den or to this den. And she might be out foraging, scavenging for whatever she can find. And she's left the cubs safely ensconced in the den itself. It's just a matter of, we just have to keep checking, I think, at this point. I know all of you are really keen, as, as am I, to find out where she's gone. But she's not home today. We'll just have to keep trying. Don't worry, I'm committed to the cause. We'll see if we can't figure out where she may be. Okie dokie. So, Gwen's not here. Ah, aha, so we have a, a potential solution as to where my beanie has gone and you're all full of marvelous suggestions this morning. Thank you. I'm surprised there hasn't been a, a suggestion that a bird of prey flew off with it. That was my first thought. But uh, Pinchy Wider's hat, good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari as we bump our way out of the hyena den. You've suggested, uh, or you've said that Gwen was wearing it. Gwen the hyena was wearing it in order to disguise herself to move her cubs safely to a different den site. Certainly no one would recognize her in that hat. It is a marvelous method of <laughs> disguise. That beanie has certainly become quite the character on the show. Right. Well, thank you, Pinchy Winer's hat. Perhaps we'll have to find Gwen in order to relocate my beanie. We'll have to check the den sites more carefully. Somehow I feel, <laughs> all, all sort of absurdisms aside, I feel as though that beanie would not last very long in the jaws of a hyena. There was one very, very funny moment where I was with Dave. We were following the Nkuma lionesses and... Um, we came in through this block and the hyenas had chased them off a buffalo kill. There was much growling and it was an incredible sighting, absolutely amazing. And in all of the chaos, Dave accidentally ditched the, the cushion that he was sitting on. But the unfortunate thing about that was that it was Brian's pillow that he had been sitting on and he had dropped it and the hyenas were determined they were going to go and tear it apart. Dave was most concerned that he was going to have to explain to Brian that he'd accidentally given his pillow to the hyenas of Juma. Fortunately, we were able to get close enough and rescue it before they grabbed it. But it was one of the most concerning moments we've had <laughs> while we've been driving out here.
The hyenas do exploring, enjoy exploring absolutely everything they can find. Now, of course, many of you will be acquainted with Ronald the Rover. Now, I'm uncertain as to my feelings about Ronald's name. I'm not sure I feel as though Ronald is a truly reflective. Anyway, we'll move on from Ronald the Rover. Ronald the Rover is a little rover that has a camera attached to it and can drive around into different places via remote control. Now, the first and only time I ever drove Ronald the Rover, um, I parked it underneath a marula tree, a big bull elephant came around, kicked it over, and that was the end of my rover driving days. And then poor Alex Voz has to fix it. At least, though, I didn't drive it into the dam, which did happen. But Shamson was wondering, would we ever drive the rover into a hyena den to have a little, as a sort of a little reconnaissance mission? We would love to. We would absolutely love to. I can tell you, though, <clears throat> that that would be the end of Ronald. And I don't mean just a few minor repairs here and there. It would be the end of Ronald. Ronald would be thoroughly chewed up. The GoPro would have vanished. Bits would be flying. The, the tracks would be ripped apart. It's the same reason why Brent doesn't want to put up his camera traps without big steel boxes to protect them. Hyenas, as I said, have a certain curiosity about them, and that curiosity usually translates into exploration via teeth. And Ronald would be crunched. So yes, we would absolutely love to, um, but I think that the reality is we can't afford to replace Ronald each and every time it gets chopped. It would make for some incredible footage, though. If you could recover the, the SD card from the GoPro itself, you know, and after digging through a little bit of hyena scat, if it survived the digestive system of the hyena, and not much does survive the digestive system of a hyena, but if it survived, we would have some amazing footage to share with you all. Or we wouldn't have any footage at all. It, it, it might just be a sort of gentle drip of saliva and then black. Okie dokie, we're bumping our way away from the hyena dens. We have to move on from our search for hyenas for now. I think we're going to head across to Cheetah Plains and see how the day goes. But while we head across in that direction, Brent has arrived at the lion den. Well, we're not going to stay very long. Mom's not here. Uh, I just thought she might be on her way back with that one set of tracks coming this way. Uh, there are the three little creatures, all cuddled in a ball for warmth. And still in that little thicket there. So not the best views just yet. But they are growing so quickly. Hey, little ones. Look at that. They are so cute. But we're not going to stay. As I said, Mom's not here. So we're going to leave them be. Okay. So I did see some male leopard tracks up on the road. So I'm going to go see where those went. But I think it could be Mr. Gajima in this area. Okay. Let's leave those little cubs. Hopefully, one of these days when we come here, mom's going to be lying on the open. We're going to get an incredible view, but it's worth checking every morning. Now, this is an evil little branch. Yesterday morning in the cold, it smacked me on the tips of my fingers. And I'm not making that mistake again. Ha! Success. Now, Gary says it looks like a big storm's been through this area. And uh, with all the trees that have been knocked down and that, Gary, those are 
elephants that have done that, not a storm. We have had a storm in a very long time here. Yeah? We're in the middle of a drought. Uh, so, no, that's just elephants feeding. A lot of people like to call it elephant damage. I don't call it elephant damage. It's elephant activity. Now, when elephants push down a tree, it creates homes for scorpions, spiders, borer beetles, lots of other little creatures. So, not elephant damage at all, but elephant activity and a very important part of the ecosystem. I just need to be on the game drive for a second. Uh, I've checked in on the Ngala Den. My fuzzy is not there. Uh, zoning the area, leaving it. There's also Wanuna Ingwe and Konzo uh, at the large Jackalberry Buffalo Cut line opposite Buffalo Dam. I'm going to follow up, see where they go. Okay, now this could be Mr. Gajima, which means he might have crossed to the north. I've got his tracks here. Had his tracks there. Yeah, there is tracks. They're not going. Oh, don't go that way. And there's the next one. Have a look. Did he cross? Oh, there we go. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not that one. <laughs> that one there. Okay. I'm going to try to show you. It's quite a difficult track. Okay. Here we go. Oh, I'm too close. I'm too close. Oh, no, but he came back out. Don't worry. He hasn't crossed. He's come back out. And he's back on the road. Now, of course, leopard tracks are a little bit harder to follow than lion tracks, just due to the fact that leopard are a little smaller. And also, solitary. So you never, if you get tracks of multiple leopards, it's either a female and cubs, or it is a mating pair. Now, this is just tracks of a single male. And maybe he's going to head towards the Buffalshook Dam. Who knows? At the moment, he's still heading straight west. As I said, this area, it's probably Gajima. So we're going to keep on these tracks. Hopefully, they don't cross to the north. Uh, while we do that, let's go see how Jamie's morning is going. So while Brent, the great cat tracker, tries to track down this male leopard, we're heading south and I think onwards towards Cheetah Plains. Unfortunately, it does take us into what is indubitably the coldest place on Juma, which is Twin Dams Road, because it sits right next to the biggest river system on the property. It is very cold, very, very cold down here. I'm going into the dip, which is even worse. My fingers are starting to hurt. And a very warm welcome. My, one of my favorite questions to get each and every drive is this safari, live safari, really real? Well, Alex A, welcome on our Sunrise Safari. We are as real as it gets. Probably the most real way to watch wildlife television, if we could even call it that, around the world. So absolutely, we are a live and interactive safari experience, which means that you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And Alex A, I really hope that you stick with us because there are so many amazing things for you to see out here, so many characters for us to introduce you to. And the wonderful thing about it is that we are on every day, twice a day, for three hours in our morning, three hours in our afternoon, the best time to see game, out here in the Sabi Sand, which is a place that is the most famous for game viewing. And it really, I promise you, it really is for real. The magnificent thing about the concept of Safari Live, as we 
slowly dodge hypothermia through the dip is that it is completely live which means we cannot edit we certainly do not script the animals write their stories for us and we follow along and hopefully try and find them for you to bring you those stories and definitely the most the rawest most reflective way to watch wildlife the next best next best thing to sitting on the back of a real live safari vehicle and you have the added advantage that you don't have to wrap up in 10 million blankets and sort of shiver your way along and the wind chill factor so welcome to Alex A we'd love to hear where you are from we always enjoy hearing where our different viewers are watching from we've got people in Fiji New Zealand America Canada the UK Europe it's amazing how far the reach of Safari Live extends. It's interesting that Brent commented on the mess that the elephants have made because I was just mentioning that to Khat as he did. The fact that there are elephant tracks absolutely everywhere, but where are the elephants? Where have they all decided to disappear off to? I'm sure Brent mentioned that an elephant at some point last night blocked our driveway almost completely ridding us of a buffalo thorn that has forever caught onto clothes and so on whenever <laughs> whenever we've driven past it to go into our main camp that buffalo thorn is no more I'm actually quite sad about it I quite like that buffalo thorn but it is definitely gone And T. Smith, as we drive along in the middle of our dry season, and I see my beanie is attempting to slowly creep its way up my head, you say that it looks, the landscape looks almost lunar at the moment. It's a very good description. It is so dry. So dry out here. Let me go see what those hornbills are doing. Hold on. Sorry. We'll get back to that. What's up, hornbills? <clears throat> Why are you squawking? What is going on here? Goodness gracious. Hmm. We have stumbled upon what looks like a relatively vicious argument between two hornbills. I can't tell if they are stuck together or if they... I think that's two males fighting. The, oh! It's definitely two males fighting. Look at that! When last did you see a hornbill fight? Sizing each other up. Incredible! Yes, we've got a, a third onlooker coming to make sure that the fight is fair. Oh, they look so angry! I mean, hornbills look angry at the best of time, but look at these two. They look positively furious with each other. Oh, oh, are we going to go again? Are we going to go again? They're all males. All three of those are males. Oh, and we, we're back in. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. The one on the right has managed to hold the beak closed. Oh, they've separated again. This is incredible. pile of feathers. This is actually quite a, a vicious fight. And hornbills, you don't often see them fight together. You've, they very often... Oh, they're now watching the third one with trepidation. Everybody's on edge. They often fight their own reflection in windows, but I've never seen them properly have a go at each other like this. Oh, I'm going to take advantage of your distraction and grab some food. <laughs> I know that they're males, first of all, because they're fighting. Um, generally, the female birds don't compete as savagely, but also because of their bills. They're much thicker and more solid than that of a female yellow-billed hornbill. Oh, they all look like really grumpy men. You know the, the sort that, that walk into a bar or a pub and are just looking for trouble? That's what these guys look like to me. Troublemakers. 
Oh, are we at peace now? Or what's what's happening? <laughs> Have you ever seen such a furious looking face? What is happening here? It appears that by whatever rules the fight has been decided, it seems to be over. The challenger on the right has calmed down. Oh, hold on. I wonder if it was maybe just a, a squabble over food. Maybe. Unlikely, though. <laughs> Hopping around looking. <laughs> very intimidating. That's a leaf. That's a leaf, buddy. That's not going to be very nice. And the winner has made off with his trophy, closely accompanied by the onlooker, and the challenger has moved off. I have no idea what that was about. These two seem to be part of the same team, sort of. Perhaps a juvenile that is now fully grown on the right. Seems to be following behind the one on the left. And hornbills do do that. They they stick around with their parents. Sorry guys, I do have to be on the Game Drive channel for one second. Brent is trying to call me. Never mind, I'll just wait my turn. So the juvenile hornbills, yellow-billed hornbills, will stick around with their parents. They'll even help to raise the next, the next generation. It's known as cooperative breeding. And it's quite common in the hornbill family, in the wood hoopoe family, and so on. Megan in Ottawa, I'm also really glad they didn't get stuck. Bear with me one second, I'm just going to, Brent is now trying, if I don't respond to him I'll miss my chance. Standing by. <laughs> Copy that, I didn't check Gary Cutline, I might do that, I'm on Twin Dams now, there were no tracks coming out of Mbubu. Brent's just letting me know that it looks as though the Kahumas are back on our property. Megan, you're absolutely right. That was so cool. But I am glad they didn't get stuck. It's, it seems to have been decided relatively quickly and with a minimal amount of violence. Just by the way, that is a red-billed hornbill and not the yellow bull that we were watching earlier. Slightly smaller and obviously, as the name suggests, with a red bull. Oh, the one fight we did see, one bird fight we did see live was a fight between two fork-tailed drongos. Now that was absolutely incredible, that particular, and that turned truly savage, which is why I was watching this fight with a bit of trepidation, just wondering whether or not things would actually take a turn for the worst, because they can grip onto each other very, very harshly. And that fork-tailed drongo fight that we witnessed, the, the two birds were locked together, and we were, at one point, we were actually worried that the victor was going to kill the loser. So this fight was, that we've just witnessed was very interesting. Different species of bird. Drongos tend to be a bit more aggressive. But we always see the hornbills bashing their reflection. Whenever the sun hits a window wrong, they go and they sit on the windowsill and they thunk. Because they're not, they're not quite, mm, they're not the brightest birds. So they don't realize that they're looking at a reflection rather than a, another hornbill, a challenger. Now, it's interesting to see them actually getting it, at least finding a, a true form, a real-life opponent. I'm going to go follow up on those tracks that Brent said he had, because things have changed. So we might not get to Cheetah Plains just yet. I have to go back on myself. While we go and investigate, let's hear what his plans are. Okay, so Dave just lost his hat, and I'm in a rush. Uh, And I'm, there's a lot of alarm calls around where Herbie's been following Shadow and her cub track uh, around Triple M, so I'm rushing there at the moment. Oh, it's very chilly at the speed. 
Uh, hopefully Dave doesn't lose his cap again. No good. He's sensibly taking it off so he doesn't get shouted at again. So always check. Oh, another dip. Another little cold spot. So unfortunately, that male leopard we were tracking went into Buffle's hook. So that's why we decided to go give Herbie and Aubrey a hand following up on Shadow. And then all of a sudden, they're saying, alarm calls all over the place. Da -da -da -da. So and, and increased our speed somewhat to get into that area to help them. We're nearly, we're nearly in that area. Okay, we're here. Saying good morning to the Sabi Sands. So it's a little bit further down Triple M here. So I've got a little bit more racing to do. And while I'm racing, let's go see how Jamie's doing. Poor Dave, he must be clinging on for dear life. Hopefully his hat is returned to him once again. We're going to go and investigate those tracks that Brent found in a moment. I just want to see something quickly. I've got hyena tracks here and I thought I saw tiny little ones. Just bear with me one second. Just want to see whether or not I am right. No, I think I'm. I think it's it's hyena tracks combined with little civet tracks. I had the sudden thought that perhaps Gwen bought her cubs this side. No, no, sorry. I am mistaken. It is not little baby hyena tracks. It's big hyena tracks combined with civet tracks. I believe it would have been in the right spot for her. And I'm sorry, the cold has made my nose run and making me want to sneeze. So my apologies for that if there's a sudden and surprisingly explosive sneeze from my general vicinity. Um, it's not just me though, Khat also looks as though he's, his eyes are watering a bit. It's so cold in this drainage. Okay. Let us go and see about the lioness tracks that Brent found while he goes and follows up on the alarm calls of Shadow. Yesterday evening, Brent offered me cat finding lessons. <laughs> and hello to Chris Roundtree. It is marvelous to have you on board. You're obviously a new viewer and are wondering why our car doesn't have a roof. Because we don't need one, uh, essentially. This is the best way to experience the African bush. Yes, it's a little bit chilly. We've got the wind chill factor moving about. But imagine if we had our, a roof restricting our extraordinary view of the beautiful surroundings. Now, I think the next question that stems from that is for new viewers. Are, new viewers are often concerned about us being in an open vehicle in the proximity to the wild animals. And it's just an important thing to remember that these animals have been born and raised in an environment where open safari vehicles are as much a part of their landscape as the trees and the termite mounds. Yes, we, okay, not quite in that we move and that the vehicle makes a little bit of a noise, but essentially they've, they are very, very used to our presence. And the second thing to remember there is that we are absolutely not on anything's menu. Nothing out here is actively going to set out to harm you. The only time that accidents happen is where people have made mistakes or where the animal is feeling in a particularly bad mood, it feels threatened, frightened in some way, and it responds by being aggressive. And 99.9% .9 of the time that can be avoided by reading the animal's behavior and watching what they're doing and the signs that they are giving you. So even for the big cats, you, will, you might, if you ever happen to find yourself upon safari, you might be told that the animals don't realize that we're in the vehicle. 
They don't recognize that there's a human being in the vehicle. They don't see the outline as a human being. I don't think that's true. In fact, I don't, I, it's not even I don't think that's true. I know that is not true. I know that I have had anything from a lion to a leopard to an elephant look at me in a vehicle. Not at the vehicle, at me or at the cameraman. There is no way on earth you can convince me that animals do not realize there are people in the vehicles. They're just not concerned. We are not a threat to them. Animals have had thousands of years of evolution telling them that an upright human being walking is a threat because they might be hunted. They've had 50 years of evolution and you can't, I mean, you can't describe it in those terms. 50 years of experience where vehicles have been driving in their lives. Okay, let's say 100 years of experience in that way. And they don't, they don't see the vehicle as a threat with human beings in it. If I were to get out and walk, it's a different story. And even then, it's just about being cautious, being aware of your surroundings. And aware, for example, of the fact that my hat is attempting to make its way off my head. My goodness me! It is a morning of new viewers, and Patrick Vang is a, not a believer. Patrick Vang is a, is a cynic and does not believe that this is live. Patrick, I am thrilled to inform you that you are incorrect. It is actually live. It is 100% live. What you are seeing on your screen is happening in real life in the middle of the African bush. I promise you it's live. And if it weren't live, we definitely weren't able to predict perhaps your name and your cynicism. So Patrick Vang, it is live, I promise you, and it is marvelously exciting, and we are thrilled to welcome you on board our live safari. It is the only place in the world where you will find a live safari that happens twice a day, every day. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> I once had a viewer, um, we, we, in summer we go out very, very early, and we go out in the dark. We start the, the safari in the dark, and it slowly gets light. And we once had a viewer convinced that they had caught us out because we'd started the drive in the dark and then it was sunny again. So they somehow managed to convince themselves that we'd edited it somehow. Forgetting, of course, about the Earth's rotation and the fact that the sun rises in the morning, even in South Africa. Right. Let us look for... Oh, uh, goodness me. Chris Rogue and our other hyena lovers... Our hyenas have been everywhere. They may have moved their den site, but there are just hyena tracks absolutely everywhere in this place. I wonder if those lionesses didn't make a kill in there. And that might be, I don't know. Let's find out. Let's try and puzzle this out. And I wonder if those Franklin that Brent heard alarm calling earlier weren't letting everybody know that there were lions in the vicinity. So Patrick, I do hope you stick with us. As for all of our new viewers, because hopefully we have lions on, lions to anticipate and a leopard to anticipate. All kinds of exciting things out here to see. Uh, but otherwise all the animals have gone into hiding. I think they're having a morning lion on this chilly morning. They've decided, nope, they're all going to cuddle hidden away in the bushes. Except for those hornbills, of course. Those hornbills started off the, the morning on a, an aggressive note. Right. Now, sometimes, if the animals are not walking casually along the road, we do have to get out and go and walk to find them. Brent would just like to explain what it is he's going to do. So let's head across to him. So the last tracks of a female leopard and her cub go into this thicket off to the east of me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave Dave to guard the car. And I'm going to jump off and I'm going to walk along one of the big elephant paths, see if I can hopefully find her or if find tracks to which direction she is going. So I'm going to be off the vehicle for a little bit. So while I do that, uh, enjoy your time with Jamie. And uh, Dave's going to enjoy his time basking in the sun and trying to warm up after we rush to get you. So we'll see you a little later. Poor Dave probably needs a little bit of time spent defrosting after a, a race around the bush. 
perhaps Brent would be kind enough to give him his hot water bottle while he goes for a walk. Okay, now despite my best efforts, we're still not anywhere near Cheetah Plains. In fact, I haven't gone very far beyond where I started this morning. We are back around the Voyatella Dam, searching for lions. <coughs> oh, sorry, there's the sneeze. There it is. It's cold and dusty. My apologies for that. I know I have a mic on, so that can't be entirely pleasant for all of you. Okay, so while Brent goes walking, you guys can all help me see if we can't find these lions. They seem to really be... Oh, I found something else. They do seem to be really enjoying this particular block. And of course, it's the most difficult one in all of Juma. Something very large, finally. There you guys are. Let's wait for them to come to us. I know it's not the best view for now, but we've got a lovely herd of elephants. Oh, goodness. Definitely a hay fevery morning. Oh, and this lovely herd is quite a big herd. It is going to slowly make its way towards us, which is perfect. The best way to approach any elephant is not to approach them at all, but instead to pop yourself in a position where they are coming to you. They, basically, that leaves the choice up to them as to whether or not they come a little bit closer. Hello, big girl. There's some yummy sickle bush there. Not really to my taste, but apparently to hers. It's got huge thorns, but the mouth of an elephant is totally impervious to them. The one on the left appears to be frozen in action. Oh, there we go. Got some movement. Sometimes it seems as though elephants kind of get caught up in a daydream. They freeze sort of mid-mouthful. Mid Beautiful. There's nothing like seeing elephants in the morning sunlight. Now, whilst we all enjoy finding the bigger cats, for me, one of the greatest pleasures is to encounter elephants. I'm so recently we've had elephants pretty much every single drive, even if it's just a passing glance in their direction. And there's just something about them that is guaranteed to put even the grumpiest person in a very good mood especially the little ones like our little three-year-old calf there on mommy's right well it's actually mommy's left on our right munching away wherever she has fed there we go have a look at that And welcome to Michael, who is 18 years old. Been listening to what Brent was chatting about, about the elephants clearing an area, pushing over trees, and was wondering if there's ever a time that elephants do too much damage. Fortunately, not where we are, Michael, but you are absolutely right. They, they can do that. So elephants are known. Hello. Aren't you gorgeous? Elephants are known as what, uh, what we call keystone species. In other words, they can shape the landscape around them. Oh, we're being naughty. Stop it. Uh-uh. I'm just sitting here. Don't be full of nonsense. Uh-uh. Baby girl, come now. Come now, we're not doing anything. Ah, yes. Keep walking. Keep walking. Bye-bye. Shame. It's all right. It's okay. Here we go. Yes, you munch on that buffalo thorn. Sorry, Michael. I'll get back to your question in a moment. I just want to explain that. I want to explain that behavior because we're about to see it again. When you see that sort of behavior from the cows, it is them making sure that we know 
that they are bigger than us, stronger than us, and that... Hello, big girl. Hold on, I'll explain this in a moment. Hey, gorgeous. I see you. It's okay. It's okay. She's going to look at us. No threat. All right. Hey, big girl. Cool. So, when you see that sort of behavior from a male, especially a male of that size of the first female that came up to us, that's cheeky. That is, I am coming into my sort of hormonal teenage stage. I want to come and intimidate, pushing, pushing their boundaries, learning where their boundaries are, and basically trying to be big and scary like a teenage boy, or like some teenage boys, not all teenage boys, of course. So no offense meant there. But um, when you see it with the cows, it's slightly different. The, the cows tend to be not more nervous, but they, they don't do things f as much for fun or to try and... Um, intimidate people it's it's very much a clear protective role that they assume even with a teenager like that female was so she's she's young when she first came up to us she approached us she felt not nervous but she wanted us to know that she was keeping an eye on her so it's just making herself look big and scary and making sure that we know that we must behave and we will of course naturally we're totally respectful of that they're speaking to us it's up to us to learn their language in their home and understand what they're saying. So this little one, too scared to come and approach us directly, to come past us, but it wants to go and join the rest of the herd. So it's going to join up with the young bull and enjoy a bit of safety in numbers. It's okay, little one. Here you go. <coughs> Being ferried to safety behind us. And here comes the straggling member of the group. So what I said about us being there for them to approach us, because they've approached us, I know that I feel comfortable in this situation. And so do they, actually. There's nothing here that says these elephants are frightened. They're just reminding us how big they are. All right, big girl. All choosing to cross behind the vehicle rather than in front of it. Right, so Michael, back to your question. Elephants, keystone species. In other words, yes, you're very big and scary. It's okay, I see you. I'm not going to do anything. Don't worry. I wonder if they're being pushed by a bull. I have a funny feeling they might be. I think they might actually be harassed by a big bull elephant, and I think that's him. Here we go. That's, that's why our elephant herd is a little bit upset and constantly moving. Is he in must? No. So that's the first thing that we look for. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> I keep getting interrupted when I answer your questions. My apologies. I'm just paying close attention to what's happening here. And we've got an explanation behind our elephant's slightly upset behavior. Right, here's what he's going to do. He's very keen on the ladies, but he wants to come and intimidate us. So he's going to come. He might give us just a sideways glance, or he might come and be a bit more intimidating. Hello, boy. Oh, lady's too much of a distraction, huh? Not even bothered by the vehicle. I'm just going to keep an eye on him, just because sometimes bulls, being clever animals, like to pretend they're not interested and then come back. But I don't think that's the case this time. I think that he is far too interested in the prospect of passing on his genetic material. Okay, cool. Let's reposition slightly now that they've moved away from us. Right, poor Michael's question. Oh dear, this beanie's ridiculous, isn't it? Keystone species. Now about the fourth time I've tried to say this. So what that means is if you have too high concentration of elephants in a small area, they will and can and will convert a woodland to a grassland. So it do, it's not something that we need to worry about in our enormous 8.5 million acre property, 4 million hectares in size. It's vast and the population basically controls itself. So the bigger the area that you're in, the less you need to interfere or manage it in some way. I'm trying to find a nice position for these eddies. Bear with me. You might need to do another U-turn. But in smaller reserves, in closed systems, 
the numbers of elephants do have to be controlled because otherwise, yes, absolutely they can do far too much damage. In certain places like here, clearing away the trees, generally an over... Oh, hello. Elephant bull number two. Goodness, I wonder if there isn't a female in estrus coming through. Hello. A big boy. So in closed systems, they have to manage the area, manage the elephant population. Oh, he's magnificent. He's going to go and join the females. So let's watch, let's watch them from here. They will manage their elephant populations, usually by moving the elephants around to other reserves or else contracepting them. And there's different methods of contraception. It's, and that can be done in a way that doesn't interfere with the elephants in a massively negative way. But it does. it is one of those sad facts of life. We've closed off their migratory routes. We've stopped the, where they would normally have gone centuries ago when resources were limited. And so, as a result, we have to then manage the impact that they have because it's, it's about the rest of the animals as well. It's not just about the elephants. So a perfect black rhino habitat, for example, a woodland where a black rhino might want to hide, could be converted into grassland and therefore made more tricky by an elephant herd constantly impacting that area. So yes, they do have an impact. They do indeed have an impact on the area that they're in. But they can also be an incredible force for good. And of course, bear in mind that this landscape has evolved with elephants. So the way that the landscape, the ecosystem works, it all ties in together. It ties in with the elephants themselves. It ties in with the, the various other bulk grazers, anything like that. This is the way it's meant to be. And elephants actually maintain the balance between the woodland layer, so the trees, essentially, and the grasses. Because if there's too many trees, the grass won't grow. If there's too much grazing, the grass doesn't stop the trees from growing and you get bush encroachment, and so on and so forth. Our Ellie's are playing hard to get this morning. There might be a little bit of a scuffle between these two boys. There's a bit of posturing. Quite a nice view we've got here. They're going to keep following the females up the road, so we'll just settle for this view. And I sometimes like to watch elephants from a distance because you get an overall view of their behavior as they wander up the road. Here's their big female, and here come the two bulls. They have been pushing the herd a little bit. Oh! See? Female's not happy. Here you can see they've they're putting pressure on her. The bull going to have a quick sniff. Now he's going to is he gonna put his trunk in his mouth? No. So she's she's not in estrus or coming into estrus, but they just had to check. You know, if you're an elephant, I guess it pays to be sure. We're gonna move on for now because this is a very thick area and the, the elephants are being constantly pushed by the males, so they're not going to stick around. But it gives us a lovely opportunity as we do the drive in reverse once again. Whee! It gives us a lovely opportunity to answer Felicity's question about tuskless elephants. And yes, I will tell you more about them with pleasure. So a tuskless elephant, for those of you who haven't seen any, is a naturally occurring phenomenon. It is a genetic, you could call it a fault, it's a genetic difference to other elephants that basically means that the elephant never grows tusks. So it's not that they've been broken or removed, that elephant will never grow them. Kind of like some people grow wisdom teeth and some people, most people have wisdom teeth and some people don't. It's something similar to that. It occurs naturally in about 4% of all elephants if you take an average around the world. Unfortunately, as human beings, we have in certain parts of Africa, I say we, that's a bit generic because, of course, none of us either um, driving around showing you these things or, 
watching have played a role in the destruction of Africa's elephants. But human beings as a species have actually selected for tuskless elephants, artificial selection essentially, because of poaching. Because a, poach, a, a tuskless elephant is not valuable, so they don't get poached. Therefore, it favors that genetic line. So, Felicity, how do they eat? Pretty much, it, it's not a disaster for them. They can live just as long as the normal tusked elephants. They just change the way that they eat ever so slightly. So, they might be less fussy about picking off the bark. Or, what they might have learned to do is to... You know how, because what elephants often use their tusk, tusks for in terms of feeding, the main purpose is to go and to scrape the bark off the tree and pull off the cambium layer. That's the main use of an elephant tusk in feeding. So what the elephants will do is they'll wait until one of the other members of the herd has broken through into the, into the cambium layer and then they will move up and start stripping with their trunks. They can still gather leaves and eat them. They can still gather branches and eat them. They might not have anything to leave and to break, but it just means that their trunks will have learned to coordinate in a different fashion. The bulls might have a little bit more of a hard time because the tusks, although the tusks are not necessarily the be all and the end all of a fight, male on male fight. It's mainly the use of the size and the strength of the elephant and the top of the trunk and the base of the forehead that they push against each other. But tusks do play a role and can be used in fighting. So it might, you might find that a tuskless male elephant will be at a slight disadvantage when it comes to competing for mates. But that in turn... Oh, the birds are full of nonsense today. The Orioles are having a fight now. I'm going to try and show you, but jeepers, they're not sitting still. Oh, well, gone. Bye. Dawn. Hold on, let's see if they come back. <laughs> it's two black-headed Orioles having a fight, but they are being impossible. They're moving so fast that there's no way that poor Gert could possibly get them on camera. Let's just wait and see if they come back. No. They're now gone completely. Sorry, everybody. Would have been exciting to watch. There is a tuskless bull that hangs around. He comes through here, he comes through Cheetah Plains. He's absolutely enormous in the prime of his life. Last time I saw him, he was happily associating with the rest of the herd. And he's actually he's really nice. He's a good-natured bull. I don't know, just sometimes you get an impression for an elephant's person, personality or nature. He'll come up, he'll have a sort of benign look down onto the vehicle, and then off he goes once again. It's the elephants with the shortened trunks that have more of a difficult time feeding. It takes them longer and it is a bit more of a struggle for them. Hello, Nyala. I'm trying to gauge by the animal's behavior around here where those lions might be. I still don't know exactly where Brent saw those tracks. But everything on this side of the world looks relatively relaxed. She's glancing off in the direction of the elephants. A beautiful female Nyala for all of our new viewers. One of the most attractive of all of the antelope species with their beautiful, in the female's case, tannish coats and bold white stripes and very, very fluffy tails. And then, if you look carefully, there's actually a teenage boy at the back. He's sort of stuck halfway between getting his natural adult male colouring and the reddish colouring of the fawns and the females, or sorry, not the fawns, the lambs and the females. They're starting to look scruffy and a bit pubescent, but hasn't quite acquired the dark grey colour of an adult male. So within Inyala, they have the greatest sexual dimorphism of any of the antelope. The males are much, much larger. They're a completely different colour. They have horns and they are much fluffier than the females. So the greatest sexual difference between males and females of any antelope. 
They are also where the divide happens linguistically for us in terms of naming. Uh, we call anything s the size of a female in Yala or smaller. The male is called a ram, the female is called a ewe. So that is an Inyala ewe. Anything the size of a male in Yala or bigger automatically becomes a bull and a cow. So it is an Inyala bull and an Inyala ewe. That's where the confusion arises. I hope you're all writing this down because it does get a little bit tricky. And then beyond that, anything bigger, kudu bull, kudu cow, eland bull, eland cow, and so on. Gives me a chance to listen. The Franklin are still chirping up off in the distance. But I don't think that is due to any kind of alarm calls. I think they're just being Franklins. Right, well, I'm sure you are all very curious to hear how Brent's tracking has gone. Let's head across onto the back of Wendy to find out. Sorry, guys, I'm just listening to the radio. Shadow is giving us a real run around at the moment. We've got tracks going in all directions. I'm just listening. She's here somewhere close by. Now, I was walking with William, Aubrey's tracker. We found her tracks heading back to the north, now Herbie's found her tracks cutting to the east. Seems like she's been all around here overnight. I just want to listen for a second uh, to hear if there are any alarm calls. Standing by, I copied that message. Copy will do. Okay, so Herbie's asked us uh, to drive the power lines. He's asked Aubrey to drive Vuertela Access. So we're very confident she's around here. Now, we're hoping that she disturbs some more Impala. She did earlier. That's how they jumped from the tracks that were from much earlier last night into this area, because all the Impala were psh, 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 alarm calling. And now she's crossed on top of Herbert and Aubrey's tracks. So these are really fresh tracks. Okay, and we're just gonna go really slowly. Standing by. Thinks he might have her. I okay, hope I'm um, on the power lines approaching your mover. Where do you want me to come from? Okay, copy. I'll I'll be there now. So he thinks he had a brief visual of her uh, through the bush. So we're going to try get a little bit closer now. There we go, William's signaling, come, 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 faster! Okay, and then get out there. Ah, uh, thanks, Will. Been a serious team effort of some time to produce this cat. Hopefully she doesn't get away before we see Herbie. You looking for Herbie, Dave?
Hey, do you have my mobile audio? Confirm I'm just cutting the block from where I am. Okay, so I've got to pick my way through this very difficult area now. Okay, so Herbie's around here somewhere. And she headed more due east, so that's what we're going to do. Unfortunately, one has to pick the spot uh, to meander through these trees. Oh, this looks like a good spot. Not too thick. She followed Shadow on many occasions through this particular area. Sounds like she was chasing Warthog when they found her. Okay, so now, fortunately I know this area quite well. So, I've come through here because there's a relatively open patch through the crest of this block. As I say, relatively open. So Dave, you're keeping your eye open. She could be anywhere around here. Now if she's chased and not succeeded, a good place to check is the top of termite mounds. Yeah, I just need to be on the radio, get some better directions from Herbie. Uh, while I do that, let's go back to Jamie. While well, Brent searches for Shadow, wonderful news that Herbert managed to locate her, I have found crisp, fresh lion cub tracks. Now I have to tell you that the position I found myself in while I was look well when I found said lion cub tracks, it was not not at the time a pleasant discovery. However, I'm now very excited now that I'm back in the vehicle and we can go and have a look. And so we the intrepid explorers of the Wild Earth team are heading down into this fire break. Everybody hold on, it's gonna be a bit bumpy. Oh. Watch antenna. You okay there, Gert? Well done, Rusty. It's a bit of an angle to go down. Right. Fresh, beautiful, crisp, clean lioness tracks coming in here, along with the little cubs. I'll see if I can't find you a clear example. And so we find ourselves in the drainage system of Gauri Cutla in the place where we've suspected all along the lionesses have a den site. There's hyena tracks in here as well. Where have those cub tracks? No, I see. Going straight in. Remember how we spoke about it's such a perfect spot for hiding babies. And Carol, on the subject of our hyenas and lions, I'm just stopping to listen. You were wondering whether or not our hyenas might be following the lions in order to be 
more assured of some food and some scraps? And the answer is yes, possibly. Hyenas do follow lions. However, it's unlikely that the den site is moving as a result. So whilst our hyenas might be following lions, they're probably not doing it. They're not moving their den because for that reason. They also follow leopards in order to get food. I just need to concentrate here. We really don't want to go into any ditches. And it's rather tricky in here. So there's a big hole over there, which we don't want to go into. I don't know how far it cuts underneath the surface of the soil. So we're going to go over the top of this mound of dirt instead. Okay, still got lioness tracks on this road. So this, I think, is where our mom is keeping the oldest set of Nkuhuma cubs. Somewhere in here. But to get a vehicle in is a different story entirely. But she's got them in here somewhere. And what a marvelous surprise that would be. Oh, a bit of tricky driving in here. Just double check. Any sign of her? Let's see if there's any tracks on this road. So finding a lion den site can be a tricky experience. You've seen, while we've been watching the wonderful little cubs at the Buffelzook den site, you've seen how well hidden that lioness is. And if we didn't know she was there, if the rest of the pride hadn't led us there, we would never have known that she was hiding out in that drainage line spot. Though it is very, very tricky to spot them. Nope, she is definitely in here somewhere with her little ones. It's just a question of where. I'm just listening to the Game Drive comms updates about what's happening with this shadow sighting. My earpiece will not stay in my ear, I'm sorry. I'm trying it in. Oh! Okay, I'm sort of bitterly missing the road system that we travel on. Oh, this is going to be unpleasant. Gert, sorry, you're going to have to duck. I'm going to have to duck. There's some buffalo thorn waiting to grab onto any skin it can get. No, this is getting ridiculous. Okay. If I can't hear anything, I'm sorry. It's because my earpiece has suddenly decided that it does not want to stay or work. Bear with me one moment. Okay, that appears to be better. Cool. Back in the world of outside communications once again. double check that they haven't popped out around Hyena Road. I don't, it's definitely not the lioness with the young cubs that is at Buffelsook Dam where Brent started off his sunrise safari and I know that because of the size of the lion cub tracks that I saw there. So they're about this big, about the size of my palm, which immediately puts them in the realm of slightly older lion cubs, not young lion cubs. And I think, you know what, it might actually be worth checking up on the old den site she was using on Nyala Road North. She might even be hiding out somewhere there.
If, however, she is in the area of Gauri Katlan, then there won't be any way for us to be able to see her. Just simply because we don't, we absolutely don't have any signal in there. Here we go, back onto a proper road, and we can resume our search. I think she's hiding in there, though. While well, Brent crashes, well, not crashes through the bush, but goes off in search of shadow, let us find out how that is going. Well, it's not going very well, I can tell you that. So she crossed on top of our vehicle tracks behind us, and Herbie's still following her on foot. But she's hunting, so she's zigzagging. Now, I'm going to stand by here because there's impala and zebra in the bush here. So if they spot her, and they will erupt into snorts. Here we go, there's impala. Uh, we've got a problem with our focus ring, unfortunately. Okay, you can see the impala there. So I just want to stop and listen for a second. So, so far, the impala look very relaxed. So, unfortunately, we can't zoom anymore because of a, an issue with our focus ring. They will try to fix it just now. She could be stalking these in parlor. Now they don't look very alert, so they don't seem to think that there's a predator present. Dave's going to try again. You can see the zebra there as well. He might have managed to. No. <laughs> there we go. Now, Dave, keep checking in case she tries to do what she did to us just now and cross right behind us. We're just going to sit here and listen quietly and how exciting that Jamie's got cub tracks on and around Gauri Katlan. So while we sit here and wait patiently to see what happens, let's go back and see how Jamie's Oh my goodness, this leopard is giving us the absolute run around. Um, but we're going to cross to Jamie quickly while we turn around. She tracks are heading back in the opposite direction. Oh, while Brent attempts to relocate Shadow, we've come along to Hyena Road. And I have to tell you something, it's amazing how a several ton elephant can disappear. The only reason I saw this particular elephant, it's not far away from us, is because it moved a branch. There we go, it's stepping out into the open now. But it's something that always amazes me about our lovely, gentle giants, is the fact that they can be so incredibly stealthy and quiet, despite being an absolutely enormous animal. And as this elephant wanders forward, he was probably about, I would say, less than 100 yards away from where we're sitting, 
and we had absolutely no, he was no idea that it was there until the branches in front of us moved. Something's upset the Egyptian geese at Buffalo's Hook Dam terribly. They're very, very cross. I'm just this thing from, we're quite close to the, the drainage line system that runs from Buffalo's Hook Dam. Might be worth going investigating in a moment, but Andrew is around that area and he has said he is checking up for, going to help us check up for any signs of the lioness and her cubs coming out. Now, Hyena Road is a road that sits on a seep line system. And what that means is whenever it rains, it becomes basically one big mud puddle, which is absolutely fine in summer, you just know to avoid it. But then in winter, when you drive along it, you find yourself bouncing up and down, basically to the point that you might as well be off-road. Hello, little boy. Sorry, big boy, yes, you're very big and scary. Mustn't be patronizing. Hello, hello. Hello, boy. Don't be nasty. Are you missing a tusk? What happened there? You lose a tusk. Presenting us with a lovely view. Our gentleman here has got only one tusk, but it does bring us back to our conversation about a tuskless elephants and whether or not it, or the extent to which it disadvantages them. I <laughs> love the way he's using his trunk here, it's awesome. Is that yummy, Is that acacia tree yummy? making short work of it. Sorry, I got distracted from my original point. Anna Marie, I don't necessarily think that it makes the males less attractive to the females if they don't have tusks. Generally, the, yes, the females will choose the biggest, strongest looking elephant. They often show favoritism towards elephant bulls in must, although that I also think has to do with the temperament of an elephant bull in must who tends to be a little bit more assertive when it comes to his dominance and to his right to mate. So there might be a bit of bias there in terms of the studies. So females will mate more frequently with must bulls, but... <laughs> Did you hear this game drive comms at the moment? It's hilarious. Attempting to find Shadow, who has well and truly given everybody the slip. You know what? Sorry. To get distracted from this elephant for a second, if Brent doesn't find her, um, I'm going to offer him leopard finding lessons, since he kindly offered them to me yesterday evening, because it took me two days to find her. So he, he kindly offered me leopard finding lessons, and naturally I thought that was a lovely idea, as you can imagine, since I haven't exactly suffered for cat sightings recently. So... um. Perhaps if Brent doesn't find Shadow, perhaps I could give him a few tips and pointers. I'm sure that will go down very well. <laughs> we'll see. You know, of course, now he's going to be thoroughly determined. Blue, don't pass that on. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Too late, it's done. Thank you, boy. It was a lovely sighting. Now, his tusk... That is not due to any kind of genetic abnormality. I'm keeping an eye on him because he's, he's looking at us out of the corner of his eye. That tusk is not due to a genetic abnormality. He broke that off. It might have been a fault line in the tooth itself. You know how some people have weaker teeth than others? Sometimes they're born with a crack in the tooth. That might have been the reason why he lost that tusk or he might have broken it off when fighting or pulling with it, whatever it may have been. It may even have been an infection in the root itself that caused the tooth to fall out. And elephants do get infections at the base of their tusks, and it is 
I mean, obviously we, they can't tell us this, but it must be unbelievably painful. Because just think, if a tusk can grow to weigh easily three times my weight, up to about three, no, that's an exaggeration. Let's say maximum one tusk would weigh about, in the, in the biggest tuskers of the world, about 160, 180 odd pounds, even up to 200 odd pounds, that's one tusk. Imagine how deep that root system has to be in order to support that weight. And then you can imagine what it must be like for them to have a crack in the tooth or something similar, the crack in the tusk, because that is what a tusk is, it's a tooth. And that infection to be sitting in the base of the root of that tusk. Oh, you, as those of you who have experienced toothache, you can sort of sympathize, you can put yourself in the elephant's shoes, but can you just imagine what that must be like? And in, in fact, a lot of elephants that have been labeled as problem elephants, as grumpy, unpleasant elephants that are angry all the time, a lot of the time it's been because they have been found to have an abscess or something similar in their, in their tusk. And it must be agonizing. It must shoot through into their head. And then there was, of course, the famous of the great tuskers of the Kruger National Park. And I'm going to move on a little bit. I'm going to keep going just because our elephants are playing hard to get in the bush. Near the great tuskers of the Kruger National Park, there was one called Mafufunyan, the angry one or the crazy one. And he was later discovered to have a big hole in his skull when he died of natural causes. He had a big hole in his skull, probably caused by another elephant's tusk. Now, drumroll, has Brent found Shadow? Or will I have to give him some lessons when we get back to camp this morning? Let us go across and find out. We're just standing by listening at the moment. She's been up and down all around, giving us an incredibly hard time. So Aubrey's gonna go stand by a little bit further on. Herbert and, and Aubrey, I mean and William are in the block tracking. So we're just trying to use our ears to find her now. A cysticular a little bird alarm calls anything. Now she's crossed behind us on top of our tracks on once and on top of Aubrey's tracks once. So she's really giving us a hard time. But she is hunting, so she's she's chased Warthog, she's chased Impala, and then <laughs> disappearing constantly. So we're just using our ears carefully. I'm listening for any sound. A squirrel, an impala, kudu, Franklin. Still listening. Oh, come on, Shadow, where are you hiding? I'm just going to try to get an update from Herbie shortly. He's been quiet for a while. Just listening, still nothing. All I can hear is a chin spot batters and a canary. Try and make sure she doesn't pass behind us. I said I'm just trying to get hold of Herbie. Aubrey's doing it for me. Okay, Herbie's just giving me an update. Okay. 
Okay. So it sounds like she's in the block but heading a bit further to the west of us. Now, Tom in Scotland's wondering if birds and animals ever alarm at the vehicles. Um, not really. Some birds will alarm at us when we're on foot, uh, but not, not really while we're in the vehicles. The vehicle isn't really like any living creature out here. It doesn't move like an animal that's alive. It doesn't smell or sound like an animal. Actually been skedaddling all over the place, Mr. Shadow. Now she's quite renowned for this. She ducks and dives and moves in all sorts of directions. Cutting straight west. Yeah, super. Okay, we're gonna go around again. She managed to sneak behind us yet again. Okay, so we're gonna head back up towards the gate, then back down onto Triple M. There's no roads in this area, but who knows, maybe she'll just change direction and pop up in front of the vehicle. Well, Sham Sun said, don't forget to check behind you, Brent. She might sneak up on you. Well, I would be happy if she snuck up on us because at least then we'd find her. Uh, this zigging and zagging just behind a bush we can't see is, is, is a little bit frustrating, but also quite exciting. And I mean, we are in a live safari. We can't just produce animals on, on cue. So this is how it works when you're on safari. Often you'll spend the majority of your three hours searching for a big cat, the tracker's out on foot, and then at the end, hopefully, but a dum but sometimes, but a bleh, so you never know. Now, Kyle is wondering uh, if I need some le leopard tracking advice. Kyle, you're being quite rude. Uh, and I think Jamie might have started that. And just, just to remind Jamie, this is my first drive looking for Shadow, not my fifth. Okay. And let's see if there's any sign of any tracks here. Oh, Herbie's calling me. Copy, Herb. I'm going uh, wait till I access round to Triple M again. Okay, now come on, Shadow. We've now got her into a smaller block. Uh, without roads, it's a little triangle. Herb is following on foot. Aubrey and I are coming down at reasonable distances between each other down Triple M because she seems to keep sneaking between us. So, as I, I made a joke with Aubrey a little bit earlier, saying, Well, we should just follow each other around, and eventually one of us is going to bump into her as she tries to sneak behind. go slowly slowly and there's Aubrey ahead of us
What? Sorry, I'm just listening to the radio, it doesn't make sense. Oh. So I'm just trying to get what's going on here. There seems to be a confusion on the radio. I think what we might need is a head clear. Leave the area for, for 10 minutes and come back. Uh, but probably not uh, that. I, that need to find this leopard is now quite strong. It's become more than a want, it's a need. We're going to keep checking very carefully around here. So far, no tracks crossing out of Juma, which is good news. And Shadow really likes this broken country in here. Uh, while we do that, Jamie's got something fluffy to show you. I do indeed have something fluffy to show you whilst Brent continues his search for Shadow. In this case, a female waterbuck making the most of the nutrients around a termite mound. Now, yesterday, Gert and I found the most extraordinary, or had the most extraordinary waterbuck sighting, a female that had obviously had a very narrow escape from some kind of predator. She was drenched in blood all the way around her ear, down the back of her neck. We discussed it at length, and I obviously went to Brent for his opinion on that particular injury and he said he thinks I dismissed it I said I didn't think it was dogs wild dogs I thought that it was a bigger predator however Bren said apparently with the larger creatures like the waterbuck one of the, the sort of the dog hunting techniques is to try and reach up and grab them by the ears so in that case it may well because we were furiously racing to try and catch up with the wild dogs that we found tracks of in that case it may well have been an injury inflicted by the wild dogs themselves and the waterbuck cow in question had made a very fortunate escape. So an a very intriguing sighting and one that I learned a great deal from. And now I've stopped at this herd of waterbuck just to see whether or not there's any sign of that poor female who by the way I think would be absolutely, she'll be absolutely fine, she'll survive that injury Animals tend to be far more resilient than us as human beings. But there is no sign of her in this particular group. All of them look whole and intact apart from the odd flea-bitten ear. They seem to be perfectly fine. They are moving off in front of us. Let's go for one last view. While we attempt to catch up with our lovely ladies, hello girlies, Justin has a question about our male antelope. Now, with the kudu, it doesn't often happen with waterbuck. The male waterbuck, of course, have horns. The females do not. It doesn't often occur with the shape of the waterbuck horns. However, with something like a kudu, with their spiraling horns, they do occasionally get locked together when they fight. Locked together to the point that they... They get stuck, they can't unscrew themselves, and very often one or both of them actually dies in that scenario. Now Justin would like to know if we came across... Whoopsie! Panic! <laughs> it's okay, girls. <laughs> that was entirely self-inflicted, that panic. <laughs> it pays to be on edge constantly, I suppose, if you are on somebody's menu out here. Justin would like to know if in that scenario we would interfere. Um, the answer is probably not. I have in the past, Justin, um, and it was in a situation where the one party concerned, the one kudu concerned, had a clearly broken back as a result of struggling with the other with the other kudu bull. The ending was not 
not what I would describe as happy. It wasn't a happy moment for me. It wasn't a happy moment for anybody concerned, but I have interfered in that scenario. I won't go into any further detail because it's not something I look back upon with pleasant memories. Um, it's a difficult one. That was a, a unique scenario. It was in a closed system. It's a very different situation to the one we're in now. Our policy is no, we don't interfere. We don't interfere with the animals in a situation where what is happening to them is part of the natural way of things. So unless it is a, as a human infliction, if there's a human cause behind it, if it's a snare, if it's a gunshot, if it is anything like that, something that has been caused by a human being interference, then yes, we will absolutely, not we personally, we, we don't have any such power as the Wild Earth team, but certainly in general management teams will interfere and they will help the animals concerned. Um, and even in certain situations in closed reserves with particularly endangered species, if there is an injury that has, we had many years ago, I won't say where, there was a rhino that had come into conflict with a hippo with a broken leg and the hippo inflicted some quite nasty injuries on this particular rhino. And in that case we intervened because obviously rhino have enough to contend with and are endangered as a result of human interference and therefore we did interfere in that situation even though it was a naturally induced injury. It's always a tricky thing, it's always a very emotive issue but for the most part no we do not interfere and it's difficult to do and just bear in mind that let's say two kudu got caught together how do you release them? You have to dart them, you have to put both of them to, you have to anaesthetize both of them in order to release them if indeed you can you might even have to cut a horn off in order to do so so now you, you have an enormous impact on the animal, you aren't guaranteed of its survival plus you've had to get a vet out, you've had to manage to approach them somehow it becomes a very very complex operation so for the most part no we would not interfere but it's a difficult one it is really truly a, one that nobody ever one likes or enjoys seeing an animal struggle or suffer. It's not a pleasant situation. I have encountered it once or twice in my life and I've once found two dead males, um, both of whom had died as a result of being caught together. And there's a spectacular statue in Skukuza camp, rest camp, in the Kruger National Park and if you ever find yourself in that area go and pay it a visit. It's one that for me has very powerful childhood memories attached to it. I used to go and stand and stare at this bronze casting of two kudus locked in combat. And it's a memory that stuck, to, stuck with me so when I saw it for the first time in my adult life, in my working life out in the bush, it was a very very poignant moment. I have wonderful news and all jokes aside, I really, uh, all jokes aside, Brent is off on foot looking for shadow and whatever jokes I may have made, I'm only saying this because he's off the vehicle, whatever jokes I may have made, if you want to find a cat, Brent is absolutely your man. He has sheer determination and skill in the bush when it comes to searching for the big cats. It is not by luck that he has had the most extraordinary cat sightings recently. And just a little point there, <laughs> all jokes and teasing aside. I'm checking for the lioness in Inyala Road North. We have had signal, very good signal here on Rusty in the past, so we should be absolutely fine. And let's just investigate and see whether or not she's around. But for those of you who are keeping an eye on the Juma Dam camera in between drives, please do. There's a chance she might take those little ones for a drink at some point. So do keep an eye on them. And I I wonder whether the presence of the lions didn't prompt Gwen to move her hyena cubs away from that area. I just wish I could figure out where she'd gone. Oh, there we go. We have a, a question from Gwen, uh, Jen, sorry not Gwen, Gwen's the hyena, sorry Jen. <laughs> Jen in Idaho saying, do lion cubs need to drink much in the way of water when they're still suckling from their mother? No, they don't need to drink water at all. She might need to drink though and she might take them with her just because they are getting old enough to accompany her on little excursions like that. 
but no they don't need while they're still suckling they don't need to drink from their mother I mean to drink water they drink from their mother they get all of the nutrients and the, and the moisture that they need from her milk however uh, we're almost getting to the stage where our little lion cubs who must be close to two months old now we're not sure of their exact age but they must be around two months maybe even a little bit older they're going to start weaning very very soon and eating meat only and as a result then yes they will need to go and drink just as regularly as the rest of the pride oh i'm so excited for our lion cub sightings we're going to have so many magical moments as our little sets of lion cubs get older and bigger and stronger they're going to be gambling with the rest of the pride and it's something for us to eagerly anticipate something interesting to show you there's not that many of these on Juma and it's very very pretty to look at one of my favorite tree species is a fig tree and we don't get many of them out here but this is one of the few strangler figs and it has attached itself to this enormous leadwood so if we have a look at this ancient old tree in front of us with the stunning silhouette it's actually two trees and if we take a little bit of a closer look, you'll be able to see a bit more clearly exactly what I mean. So have a look there. You see the, the sort of the root systems, totally different bark to the cro almost crocodile-like skin of the leadwood. And that is a fig tree. There's lots and lots of different types of fig trees out here. In this case, it is a parasitic strangler fig. Now the leadwood has proved to be relatively resilient and leadwoods are one of the strongest trees if we could put it that way that's why they call leadwood completely solid and resistant to wood borers and other such things but it has provided a really stable platform for the strangler fig and it looks as though the strangler fig which basically taps into the tree's nutrient system and parasitizes it in this case it looks as though it's killed off part of the leadwood but not all of it you see these a lot on the rocky crevices in the mountains of south africa along with the rock figs themselves a very common sight to see there but we don't see them all that frequently and that seed of the strangler fig would have been carried by one of the bird species and then deposited through their feces upon the tree or by baboons it could also be baboons but one of the one of the sort of arboreal creatures of the Sabi sand will have deposited a fig seed on the leadwood tree and actually here's a nice view of it we're on a bit of a slope but it is a nice view in the sun and it has resulted in a parasitized tree and the leadwood's still alive it's still got leaves but there you go you can really see the difference in color between the two the leadwood on the left and the pale gray almost greenish bark of the fig tree and we haven't often had signal here so we don't often get to stop and talk about it but it's one of my favorite trees on Juma okay onwards so much for my idea of going to Cheetah Plains this morning definitely has not happened but that's okay there's plenty to find on Juma Aha! Rich in the United Kingdom, good morning to you and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. 
Now Rich is relatively new to our Safari Live experience and has a more practical based question about something that sits on the front of our vehicle and basically occasionally makes our lives a bit more tricky when it comes to off-roading but otherwise results in some extraordinary things. That Rich is a VR rig or a Go GoPro or a virtual reality rig made up of seven GoPros in a ball. Now that's obviously GoPro 5 in case you needed a translation there. You can see it's flashing blue that basically just means the wireless is on and connected to the remote. Now Rich what we do is whenever we come across an, ex an extraordinary sighting uh, station with the Angala at Buffelzook Dam for Jamie. Sorry guys. Good morning, can I join you? I'm almost at Buffelzook Dam. Copy that, thank you. We shall explain on the move. <laughs> we were going there anyway, so we've got some marvellously exciting things. But I'm not going to tell you what they are. Most of you have got it because most of you now understand our Shangan terms. That basically, Rich, records a 360 odd degree view. So you've got a video clip that you can look around. So depending on what particular platform you're using, if it's a phone, if it's a smartphone, you can do a little scan of the area and it moves with you. So it's virtual reality. You know those fancy headsets that um, a lot of the phone companies have been advertising now? You slot your phone in and you look around. That is what that records. And we usually wait for a sighting where we've got animals very close to us. The best ones we've got have been with elephants. And we pass on those video clips or those clips and they get utilized in certain ways. So that is what our virtual reality rig is for. Um, if you want an example, you can Google, I'm trying to think, the only one I think we've got at the moment that is accessible to the public is the Naughty Elephant. So if you Google Naughty Elephant, you will find a virtual reality clip on YouTube and you'll be able to look at a complete round view of whatever it is we're looking at. And you can, you can look down at the base of the vehicle, you can look up, you can have a look at the elephant, you can have a look at what I'm doing in that clip, you can have a look at whatever it is wherever you want to choose to look. It was an interesting sighting that just by the way. Alrighty, nice surprise. I was on my way here anyway but we've timed it beautifully because lo and behold there is a surprise at Buffles Hook Dam. Not entirely sure where the surprise is. Stand by. Oh, oh cool. How lovely. And a male. There you go, everybody. Patience has paid off, and we've got a marvelous sighting of a male, a female, and another lioness a little bit off to the right, having a quick drink at Buffelsook Dam. Now, does that male look very young to you? Who have we got here? I'll have to get closer. There's, um, that's a surprise. No, surely not. My instinct says it had to be a, has to be a Birmingham boy. Just naturally, but... Okay, now we've got to go a little bit closer. Okay, bear with me. We're going to reposition and we're going to go and find out immediately which particular male this is. Yay! We've got some lions on our live safari and we just have to say a big thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, ah, good, thank you. How are you? Hi, guys. Tell me, um, where's, the, where's the one that has got the, the cubs? The cubs. There's a, if you go along the fire break, um, just sort of between Buffelzook Dam and Buffelzook East, you'll see the two track that goes in there. If you go along the fire break, you'll see it there. She wasn't there this morning. But um, she might have come with this group now to go yeah. feed them. Oh, I think this might even be her. We're going to go a bit closer and investigate. There's three mothers. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful, Wonderful. Thank you so much for this. Right. Cool. Right. Enjoy. Thanks very much. Yeah. Cheers.
Guys, some exciting stuff. I'm going to reposition to go and see these lioness and the male lion while I do that. Let's head back to Brent for a quick update. It cannot be. So, no sign of her just yet. Uh, Herbie and I are heading back to Last Tracks for another walk. Um, or I think we, she might have got the better of us so far. I might, if I have no luck on my little walk, I'm going to head back down towards Impala Plains. Maybe she doubled back towards where we think she left the cub. So while we do that and race down the western edge of our traverse area, uh, let's go to Jamie and those lions. Now, Jamie's not quite with those lions. Jamie's actually trying to figure out how on earth we're going to get to those lions because the path that we had is no longer there and if I try and take us down here we're going to go crashing. We are going to have a disaster. <laughs> it's positively a cliff face where we used to be able to get downhill. You want to go down? You want to go? You want to do it? Woo! Cat's feeling brave this morning. Shall we be brave? Just it just goes straight, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Preferably not straight down. Okay. No touching of brakes going to occur here. I'm only just a bit worried about this looseness of the sand. We might have to accelerate down here. Oh, what fun. Like a little mini roller coaster first thing in the morning. No wonder the Egyptian geese were so across. Remember how I said the Egyptian geese are across at Bivalzog Dam? Well, no wonder. They've got surprise visitors. Okay. Let's try and find a nice position. Hello, boy. Okay, not as young as I thought. Hello, boy. No, this is a Birmingham boy. I thought for one heart-stopping moment that perhaps the young Nkuhuma male had returned. You know, in other words, Junior. And that would, whilst we are always happy to see Junior, that would not have been good news at all for our new lion cubs. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know where my voice has gone. It will come back to us in a moment. There's our two ladies looking out calmly across the water. Who have we got here? Is that amber eyes on the left? Difficult to see in this light. I think it is. Yes. Hello, beautiful. Easily identifiable with those incredibly bright, almost orange eyes. Hence the name amber eyes, in case you were wondering. One of the few in Kuhuma lionesses that is not immediate or not in late stages of pregnancy or with new cubs. She is just finished mating with one of the Birminghams. And then who have we got off to her right? Ah, a new mother. Hello, beautiful. There's definitely suckle marks on you. Is this mom of young cubs? I think this is mom of the, the younger cubs. She definitely looks as though she's got suckle marks on her belly. So it's one of our new Nkuhuma mothers. I have yet to see the mother of the youngest set of cubs clearly. I've only ever seen the back of her. So it is lovely to see her. They're looking very round-bellied. It might even be... Oh, look at those clear suckle marks. Oh, beautiful. Somebody's got babies. <laughs> and one very round belly... Nice to see that they have eaten. The Birmingham boy has eaten as well, so they've been sharing a kill somewhere along the lines. Oh, that was very flirty, Amber Eyes. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, which way is the wind blowing? Oh, it's blowing straight towards us. Thanks very much for that, mister. He, um... As he lay down, he exerted some pressure upon his rather ballooned stomach, and that resulted in a release of 
a certain amount of gas from the products of his digestive processes. Thank you very much for that, mister. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Fortunately, the wind is working to our advantage a little bit here. It's gusting. It's taken it away. Oof. What's up, boy? What's there? Is there another male lion going to come and join us? He seems restless. He's looking off into the distance. Ooh, what's around his face? Has he got blood around his lips? What has happened to you? Is that from a kill? Or is that from an... Ooh! Ouch! Ooh! Yeah, absolutely. Not for sensitive viewers. He has got an enormous gash on the side of his face. It's, oh, goodness. That gave me the chrulls there. Um, the shivers, basically. <clears throat> Ouch. Now that has not come from a an injury related to hunting. That's fighting. He's been fighting with another male lion. It could be a member of his own co coalition. It could be another male in a different territory. They were up in Manuleti, so perhaps they, oh, they might have encountered the Salati males. Sure. Sorry, guys. Definitely not for the faint of heart, that. And it's clearly hurting him, as you can imagine. He's missing an entire portion of his lip. And that will never grow back. He'll be fine. It's not a life-threatening injury. But, um, Sure. I wonder what on earth happened to this particular male lion. What happened to you, boy? Yo! Right into the portion of his cheek. Hmm. These animals are incredible. The life of a lion, a male lion included, is not glamorous. It really isn't. Oh, shame. You can see him twitching, scrunching up his his face. That's really sore. That's really very uncomfortable. Shaking his head, trying to relieve the pain a little bit. No wonder he sort of was a bit skittish when we pulled up. Oh. I don't know about anybody else. I'm not particularly squeamish, but um, I'm feeling a bit like the hair on the back of my neck is standing on end right now. Just because that looks so incredibly uncomfortable. I wonder how that happened. Right, sorry. I got distracted actually from the question that came through. He might be looking up for the rest of his coalition mates. And the Birmingham boys are a collection of brothers and cousins from a pride known as the Birmingham Pride that came from a farm, wait for it, guess it, called Birmingham. That is connected to, well, it's connected to the Timbavati, which is open to the Kruger National Park in Baluli and down to the Manuleti and so on and so forth. So basically he came from this, this reserve that we're in just a little bit further away. And typically male lion coalitions are formed by litter mates or cousins or brothers from the sort of similar generation around the same age of male lions that, because safety in numbers is a huge advantage in the male lion world, move off together. The Birmingham boys started off as five. They are now down to four. But it does bring us to Siberia Zumi's question about whether or not the Nkuhuma cubs, if they are males, will form together or as a coalition. What is the likelihood? Exceptionally likely. So ideally for them, what we want to see, I, I feel, this is just me personally, but of course it, it doesn't have to be this way, but I would very much like to see lots of females in the Nkuhuma cubs, just because it means that it will supplement the numbers of the Nkuhuma pride. And then... Rather than having one solitary male cub, maybe two or three, to provide them with an advantage. However, the young Nkuhuma male, known as Junior, he was completely on his own. He had to set off on his own, nobody to help or support him. And as a result, he's been sort of running scared for a little while. He's done very well. And what he's done is he has met up with another unrelated lion of a similar age. The lions are not necessarily geared towards just forming coalitions with litter mates or with related males. They are happy to form a coalition 
between or between uh, with unrelated males just because in the lion world safety in numbers or advantage of numbers actually is more realistic it's not about safety it's about having the advantage is very very important sure that is quite the injury that he has acquired our two lionesses are unconcerned full bellies which is why I honestly think it's re it's really worth reverse tracking them and what I mean by that is the complete opposite of what poor Brent is trying to do now this morning trying to follow up on shadow he's trying to follow her footprints in the direction she's going it would really be nice to follow the they keep looking off in the distance I'm gonna keep watching off in that direction so rather than trying we know where the lions are we are actually gonna try and track them backwards and see if we can't figure out if they've got a kill hidden somewhere here because then we've got a, a chance of a marvelous sighting this afternoon uh, while I try and figure out what our lions are looking at let's go and find out how Brent's forward tracking exercise is going so still no luck we're we're sitting and listening again Herbie is in this bush here He's got some, got some tracks. And we're just hoping to hear an alarm call. And she's definitely lived up to her name today. Uh, no sound, so let's keep moving. We're going to keep looping because she's in here somewhere. So last tracks crossed through here. I mean, I've just been down there on the other side on the road. So I think I'm going to move around and walk in the opposite direction that Herbie's walking. There's a warthog running at high speed. Now, of course, they could be running from Herbie and not the leopard. Let's try to see if we can get a view of them, but they are moving very quickly. Oh dear, no, they're gonna keep keep running. So we'll keep, maybe we'll catch them around on the other side of the thicket. Come on, Shadow. So the warthog's running here. Yeah, hopefully we'll get a, a view. Now, of course, hopefully those warthogs run into Shadow. And I can't see where they've gone. They must have stopped in the thickets here somewhere to the west of us. And we're just going slowly and every now and then we switch off, we listen, see if we can hear any alarm calls. While well, we've got Herb on foot in the block. Quickly across to Jamie. we found what the lions were looking at. I know it's right behind us, so it's really difficult for Gert, but just look who's come to join us. Yes! What an awesome sighting. Hello, little monsters. Delectable little monsters, as Brent calls them. One, two, three. Little bundles of joy. <laughs> oh, magic. What a stunning surprise. Tax two more fuzzies with three more pimpons approaching. Ah, yay, this is so wonderful. We're gonna turn around, reposition quickly. They're gonna come for a drink. Oh, this is so special. Special, special, special.
Hello, little magic creatures. I don't even need to say anything. They're even going to go and have a drink. And these are the scenes that we have been waiting for for months and months. Guys, I'm going to reposition quickly so you can watch the cubs drink. Look at that! Perfect little miniatures. What a stunning surprise. Absolutely magic. Sure, I hope all of our new viewers stayed on board with us. I don't even need to say anything. The picture says a thousand words. <laughs> are we happy? Yes, we are happy. It doesn't get better. Oh. You sleepy little one, your parents have been walking you hard. Hmm? Oh, what's that? Is that mud? Is that mud on your feet? On your little paws? Oh! <laughs> Oh, my word. Oh! Angry elephant somewhere. Oh, look at these. Lapping away at the water. This is just so perfect. We were talking about lion cubs drinking. And the fact that they were going to start needing to, because they're going to start feeding off kills. All of our lions here have wonderfully full bellies, so they've obviously been on a kill somewhere. Oh. <laughs> Some fantastic commentary for me, sorry. <laughs> it was just too cute. And there's a definite sense of curiosity here with our little lion cubs. It's clearly one of the first times that they've had to walk up to the muddy edge of a dam and lap away at the water. <laughs> clearly don't have any problem with getting their little paws wet. Shamsan, no, the leopard cubs, I mean, the lion cubs won't play in the water. They might walk into it. They're not afraid of it, and they are, at this age, more than capable of swimming. However, they, it might be safe here in Buffelzook Dam, but lion cubs throughout Africa definitely would not be allowed to go paddling about in a dam because of the risk of crocodiles. So their instinct would tell them to only go into the water if their mothers were leading them through it. And in parts of Botswana, of course, they do, and other watery areas in deltas and swamps, they do have to swim from island to island at a very young age. So they can do it, but they'll only do it if encouraged to by mom. Oh, have you got dirty little mud beards? Well, 
then big girls. I'm just going to be quiet for the moment and let them come right up because they're going to come right close to the vehicle and we don't want to scare them. So we'll keep movements nice and slow. Guys, we're going to get to see them meet each other. Oh, wow. Oh, how stunning. This is just such an incredible sighting. It is so, so special. Oh, a little bit of hissing from new mom. Oh, she's still feeling a bit grumpy. Contact calling from between the cubs. If you don't mind, I'll just take five more minutes and then I'll pull out. Family photo. Family photo. Look at that. Take plenty of screenshot guys, we can't stay for too long, it's a two vehicle lock and there are other people that want to come and join us, but this is just magnificent. Oh wow. Absolutely, that is spot on, a family portrait. <laughs> Little cubs, where are you going? You playing? Oh, absolute magic. After the months of chaos and confusion that we have watched the Inkahuma Pride go through, to see these little new arrivals and the whole pride together and at peace is just so incredibly special. Since the Birmingham boys take over a year ago, we have finally got to the point where the Nkuhuma pride can start recovering, have their new cubs in peace and raise a whole new generation of fierce predators. And they do look very fierce, don't they? awe-inspiring and terrifying, striking fear in the hearts of all creatures, with, especially with their muddy beards. <laughs> so, the Nkuhuma Pride, five adult females, at least six cubs, so 20, what is that, 11, plus probably another set of cubs that will most likely number somewhere around three, which would bring the Nkuhuma Pride from five last year after the deaths of three lionesses throughout the previous few months and the loss of junior we've got the numbers right up to potentially 15 but at least 11 I couldn't be happier Felicity, absolutely our little lion cubs are incredibly strong and stocky at this point. Lion cubs are first of all very quick growers and then secondly they are powerful little beasts even at this age. Uh, would they be strong enough to pull a piece of meat away to chew on themselves? Yes they would be. Now although they are only about the size, and they're shorter, but about the size of a domestic house cat at this point, they are far stronger and far heavier. 
And the advantage of growing up with siblings is that they get to practice their fierce fighting skills and build up their strength very, very quickly. Aww. And already, those bonds that will be so essential to their... Oh, is it, is it sleep time? Is it sleep time in the sun on the log? And yes, already they are very, very strong. Sharp claws, razor sharp little milk teeth, little miniature predators. Of course, it'll be another two years before they are able to hunt and look after themselves, but that's okay. They've got the safety of a loving family to protect them. And now we must hope that the Birmingham boys maintain control of this area so that we can watch these little bundles of fluff go from bundles of fluff to adult lions. How lucky are we? <laughs> James Richard says that he's going to be going to bed with a smile on his face. What an incredible sighting. So will I. I'm going to be walking around all day with a smile upon my face. I'm so glad that this is the way that the morning went. It's very special. Yes, James Richard, absolutely. There will be smiles across the world as a result of three utterly adorable little lion cubs. You're chewing on your sibling, hmm? Half-hearted attack from behind. <laughs> okay, guys, just another minute, and then we must go. Oh, but I don't want to. But we have to. I'm sorry. <laughs> Three beautiful little additions to the Inkahuma Pride. Innocence personified, sort of, and with no idea just how special they are to so many people across the world. Just lion cubs being lion cubs. Okay. This is going to wrench my heart, but it is time for us to go. <laughs> Shamsun has said that the cub in the middle is the quarantine poser of the lion cub world. And quarantine, of course, known for his photogenic poses that he strikes every now and again. Agreed, although cub in the middle is now fast asleep. We have to leave them. We have to let Tax come and enjoy this. We cannot keep the sighting to ourselves. There's lots of people that want to see it. So we're going to pull out. I'm going to get Tax to approach. Tax, Tax. Oh. oh, okay, copy. Orbs, sorry. Orbs, if you want to make your way. Stunning. Sorry guys, it was Aubrey that is waiting to come in on this sighting. His radio is suddenly working properly, which was the reason behind my confusion. Alright little lion cubs, one last look and it's time for us to go. I'm going to send you back over to Brent. I'm going to drive out with a broad smile upon my face. In the meantime, let's find out how Brent's morning is going. So, Shadow has continued with her nonsense and there's no other way to describe it as nonsense so I've walked this little river system in front of us here and Herbie was coming from the other side and Herbie's just popped out here there's Herbie and her tracks are on top of my boot prints so I think it's just one of those days she doesn't want to be found <laughs> and you have those days with leopards and it looks like she might have crossed. We've been standing by here just in case she popped out. But it looks like she might have headed into Sibambili. Have a quick look. 
but we're going to keep moving. I think let's go out and see if we can find some Ellie's before the end of drive. And unfortunately, I think today Shadow has got the best of us. Well, this morning at least. Cheers, Herb. Good luck. She crossed behind us again. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Herb. Okay, so she gave us the runaround. Ah, oh, there she goes. So while I was walking, she obviously came behind Dave <laughs> and across. Let me just let the guys in the west know. Uh, any stations in the west still mobile? Sounds like they're already all home for breakfast. Just a quick check on one of her favorite termite mounds. Nope. Uh, if any stations copy me, Shadow has crossed uh, into Sibambili, just to the south of one eye pan. Okay, let's go see what else we can find for the last little bit of the drive. Joshua is wondering what are the, some of the challenges we faced, face as a cam ops and presenter team. Uh, well, I'd say one of my biggest ones is Jandre singing. Hats flying off. My hat? Hats flying off. Hats flying off, yes, when you're in a rush to get somewhere and cam ops doesn't have their hat on properly and it disappears and then you've got to reverse and go find their hat again. That's quite a challenge. But I think from the cam op side, it's probably following our narrative. So how we speak, or if we see something miles away in the bush, like, there, 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 why can't you see it? The cam operator's got to look through a little lens and still try to find it. Dave, can you think of any more? Uh, just being in sync. Obviously. Yeah, and that's probably the thing, being in sync. So as you know, the, a lot of the cam ops, they know as I'm speaking, and we're going to talk about Tamburji tree. So, and immediately follow your sort of eye line or your arm to the right tree. Uh, it can be quite challenging, but that's what we call that in sync. When your cam operation and your, your presenters are in sync, it's sort of, you don't need to say exactly what the cam op sort of just knows where you're going. Yes, and of course, I don't have it with me today, but I've got, occasionally if the cam ops get out of hand, oh, let's have a look, let's see if we can find one. They're very, very useful. Um, I used to use it on Andrew Francis the most, uh, but that's mainly, mainly because he was a very cheeky camera operator. See, now this would be a perfect example. Now you just break that there. And remove, you don't want to remove too much of that, you just want to remove the leaves. See, there we go. You just want to leave that nice little whippy bit. And then as soon as the cam ops gets out of hand, you just whip. Can you see, yeah, you can hear me beating Dave. No, I'm joking, I'm just beating the seat next to me. But yes, um, fortunately, our cam ops are now well trained. We don't longer lead camera operation beating sticks. Well, not that often anyway. And of course, uh, we never beat them on air, or maybe sometimes. Michael, Michael's 18 years old. He'd like to know what is one of my favorite things about growing up in the bush. Um, and we'll get on to the second part of Michael's question a little later. Um, Michael, I think it was the freedom, uh, probably. I didn't really have to worry about 
too much. And also, I'm very lucky in the fact that I grew up amongst people who knew the bush very well. So by a young age, I sort of had quite decent competency. I wasn't going to go get flattened by an, uh, an elephant or eaten by a lion or leopard. So from uh, teenage years, I was allowed to sort of take a vehicle and wander around by myself. Uh, so I think the freedom is probably the most incredible thing. And uh, that also has got a lot to do with my parents and, uh, and quite often, oh, and, and my friends' parents. Had, we would be sort of 15 and they'd give us a, a car, some food, uh, and say, go away, stop getting into trouble. And so we'd go find a spot in the middle of the bush in one of the concessions in Botswana, and we'd take our fishing rods and set up camp and spend five days there. We just had to check in once a day on the radio. So I think the freedom, and also that goes down a lot to our, our parents who felt comfortable enough and comfortable enough with us in the bush to give us that freedom at a very young age. Now, Michael is also wondering about becoming a wildlife photographer and would like to know if I've got any camera tips for him. So, Michael, I've got zero formal training when it comes to a camera uh, and basically the only tip I can tell you is just to play. Um, play, 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 play with your settings, uh, learn the camera and uh, I know, I, a lot of people might disagree with me. Read the manual. It makes a huge difference if you understand what all the abbreviations and the menus mean. Um, I know a, a lot of people, I'm not going to mention any names, who, who will argue and have you read the manual? No. So I'd say the best, best way is uh, to teach yourself. Uh, play with your camera, play with the settings, read the manual, and also play with your editing. Uh, don't be scared to experiment. I think that's the best advice I can give. Now I'm hoping we're going to find some Ellie's around here somewhere. I thought I heard some crashing while I was trying to find the elusive shadow. Still quite nippy, even though the sun is out, there's not a cloud in the sky. But here, it was very cold this morning. So I thought those ellies were in this area here somewhere. They could still be deep between roads, but we'll give it a bash anyway. I do love the dry season months. Uh, tracking is so lovely on the, on the sand and, and the different colors you get to see. Oopsie. And if we have a look here, you can see the various different colors in the bush. You can see the greens, the yellows, the oranges, the browns, the dark browns, and the sand. Now it is beautiful in the summer when everything's green, but I personally prefer the winter months. Now I'm going to keep, I was just stopping also not only to show you the view, but to see if I could hear where those elephants are. And unfortunately not. Uh, Jackie's girl is wondering how long has this drought been going on for? Um, pretty much most of this year we didn't have a full rainy season uh, we had very 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 late and very little rain this year so probably I'd say since December Decemberish maybe even Novemberish last year and the drought has made for some spectacular viewing though um, seen lots of little things that you don't often see We've seen a lot more honey badgers this dry season. Uh, Jamie had a serval on a kill. Um, African wildcat, civet, pangolin. Uh, so quite exciting. 
Now, the reason for this is there's almost no grass cover for all those little critters to hide in. So, from a game viewing point of view, droughts are actually very good. Uh, not, much, not much grass cover for the animals to hide in. It's much easier to track the predators. It is also a time of plenty for the predators, so uh, far more likely to find them on a big static kill. But that's dry season in general, and obviously that's just increased during the drought. So unfortunately, it looks like those elephants are still deep in the block. So uh, we'll have to look for them on the sunset safari. And what a wonderful sunrise safari it was uh, for Jamie. <laughs> uh, although I like tracking, so I had a great morning tracking, even though Shadow managed to evade us. It uh, doesn't mean she will be able to oh, this, on the sunset safari or tomorrow. But lovely to catch up with those larger Inkahuma cubs. And let's go see what Jamie thought about the sunrise safari. So from Dave and myself, Toodaloo. Well, I think it's safe to say that it has been a marvelous sunrise safari all around. I, I was still riding the high of that incredible sighting. Moments like that are just so phenomenally special. And just think, every time we go back to Buffles Hook Dam in the future, we will always think of that incredibly special moment where we had the Inkahuma cubs barreling about, having a little drink. Ah, oh, so special, it gives me the shivers, although that's also the icy wind that's blowing up in our direction. I also have no doubt that if Shadow hadn't decided to go to Simbombili, that Brent absolutely would have found her. A marvellous morning all around, smiles all, all across the globe, Nothing warms one's heart quite like little line cubs. Truly special, and I'm so glad we got to share it with you. Woo! There's a gale blowing up Gary cut line. And we found our lioness in the end. It took us a while. At least we know those cub tracks were fresh. We just weren't quite looking, well we did end up finding them. We just weren't quite in the right place just yet. Very, very special. I'm not sure I can top that today. And very true, I'd, I'd actually, in, in all of the cub sighting, I'd almost forgotten about the Birmingham's injury. And Shamsun is absolutely right. He will always be forever easy to identify with that enormous scar that he is going to have on his top lip. He'll be absolutely fine. I don't think we need to worry about him. I'm sure it's sore and uncomfortable. I spoke to some of the guys on the game drive comms. They saw him with that injury two days ago. So it's already healing up nicely. There's no fresh blood around it. It'll keep nice and clean. He will be absolutely fine. It just does look incredibly painful. It's a tough life being a lion father and he's probably been doing his job as a new dad, or a potential new dad, to keep those cubs safe from any marauding males that might have entered into the area. Putting himself at risk and on the line. Well, hopefully, fingers crossed, hey there we go again, but hopefully those cubs will be around, in fact I'd say almost definitely they're going to be around for our sunset safari, so you'll have to join us in a couple of hours to resume our cub cuteness overload. We just seem to be on a cub roll at the moment for all of us. It's such special time that we've got to spend with all of the new arrivals of Juma. I'm looking forward to many more wonderful moments like that. Right, well, we come to the end of our sunrise safari. Thank you, Gert, for your fantastic camera work, as well as to the lovely ladies, to Lou and Rebecca and Final Control, and a and thank you to Brent for all of his hard tracking work and Herbert. Most importantly, thank you to all of you across the globe watching. I hope you have enjoyed your safari experience. We'll catch you in a few hours for the sunset safari. See you then. Bye-bye, everybody.